This was an article that was sent by a fellow on temporary marriages making more sense than marriage for life. And believe it or not, there are actually um, tribes and um, native, like uh, in indigenous peoples, let's say, where it's quite common to have temporary unions. Um, and that makes sense, I guess, for different reasons. And I've said for a while, dudes, that, um, you know, the pro see, <laughs> the thing with the whole marriage, you know, situation is it's the only contract that I'm aware of. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you know, the chat's open for you guys. But it's the only contract that I can think of where the other party is rewarded richly for breaking it. And is in fact, not only rewarded richly, but is in many cases incentivized to break said contract. Um, in my book, I have a chapter on why smart men don't marry. If you haven't seen it yet, grab it on Amazon. It's on Kindle print and Audible. I narrated it myself. And um, there was a, uh, a segment. Actually, let me see if I can grab it real quick and I'll read it to you. Uh, but there's a segment in there that I took right out of a discussion point with um, one of uh, my comments. Uh, where is it? Smart men don't marry. I think it's in this chapter over here. Uh, there it is, 178. Man, I've gone through the uh, audio book um, quite a few times now, and I need to fix a few things in it, but I haven't actually read the print copy yet, so it's kind of cool to go through these. Where is it in here? I know I copied it in. Oh, you know what? I might have put it in another chapter. It's going to take me a while, while to dig it up. But basically, what the um, what the distilled version was was um, there was a woman that was having a conversation with a coworker, and she was married, and they were comparing notes. You know, as women do, they they often like to you know, hey, what's your life like, Barbara? Well, Becky, let me tell you all about it, sort of thing. And um, you know, they were sort of sizing up what their uh, financial lives were like. So one's married, they're both working, and the other one is uh, single as a single mom. And the single mom in the state that she was located in was actually earning more than the... They, they actually created this <laughs> hilarious uh, acronym, DINKS, Double Income No Kids, you know, was where it started. But then obviously, you know, people started getting divorced, um, you know, with kids. But they were comparing these notes and the and the divorced lady with kids earning like exact same job, like both these ladies were doing the exact same job. So they were earning the same income, the divorced lady getting assistance from the government and from her ex was earning more than the married couple. So there's an actual incentive to leave a family union and break up the household, take the kids, have them the vast majority of the time. And you will be richly rewarded. You will be paid more at the end of the day is what um, was discovered. And I break down the details in a book, so you'd have to go through it. I'm sure some of you watching know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, that was a big eye opener. And I've often said that, you know, things like marriage, because you get rewarded for breaking that contract, and in, in many cases, depending on where you live, you're incentivized to do so. And you're, in fact, and you're incentivized to do so in such a way that it actually harms the father of your kids um, pretty drastically, if we're being honest. Um, there's not a lot of guys that recover. Now, I had a conversation this afternoon with a bunch of guys in my group. And um, generally speaking, if, if, if you're well off to begin with and you're a smart guy, most guys after divorce end up with far more money once they like just cut, untie the knot, cut the ties and pay, with, you know, pay their dues. They, they generally end up with far more money, uh, but not everybody can, you know, achieve that level of success. So it's not um, something everybody can achieve. Again, there's a lot of guys I know that, that, that like go right down the rabbit hole of I'm never dealing with women again. Uh, you know, I've learned my lesson, you know, hands are burned. And I'm, I'm in the camp where it's like, look, you know, w like women are awesome. They're fun. But um, I wouldn't recommend anybody to live in such a way that the state would view as a marriage. So if you're going to do anything like that, make sure you have a cohabitation agreement or some sort of legal contract governing yourself in case it has to untie, which it you know generally does. Um, so let me read you this article here on temporary marriages, because I've often said that I think that um, these sorts of things should be like a car lease. You know, you get together and you have maybe like a five year lease 
you know, this is like a Western thing, obviously. So, you know, when I say Western, I'm not talking like Western cowboy, but like a Western thing, like in the West, where if you have to sign a contract, a marriage contract, it's something like a five-year lease. So if it doesn't work out at the end of the five years, you can just drop off the vehicle, no further obligations, as long as there's no dents in the door or anything like that. There's no scratches you have to deal with or uh, what do they call it? Excessive wear and tear if you ever lease a vehicle. And then you just kind of move on to the next vehicle. So let me throw this up on a screen and we'll hop into this. Um, yeah, Jerry says, I think they're all temporary and they all, all they all are to some degree. Um, why is my bubble there? We, that's what I'm looking for. That's the one that I like. Um, they are all, things are, always are temporary to some degree. You know, they always, they always say that it's, she's not yours. It's just your turn, right? Uh, so the, it's funny. They picked these two for the cover photo. <laughs> if there's one guy that shouldn't have not married this crazy chick, it's, it's definitely Brad Pitt. Uh, sp speaking of crazy, I've got a, um, I've got a ghosting after this, which, which is like biblical levels. Uh, and there's a lesson in it too. So we'll get to that next. Um, this is a little bit of an older one. It says a temporary marriage makes more sense than a marriage for life. Most marriages end in resentment. And why should longevity be the sole marker of a successful marriage? So this isn't a very long article. It's actually pretty short. Uh, in November 1891, the British sexologist Havelock Ellis married the writer and lesbian Edith Lees. Uh, he was 32 and a virgin. And since he was impotent, they never consummated their union. After the honeymoon, the two lived separately in what he called an open marriage. The union lasted until Lees' death in 1916. Um, this is not what most would consider a model marriage, but perhaps because of its unusualness, Ellis was able to introduce the idea that remains as radical and tantalizing today as it was in his time, trial marriages, in which he envisioned couples exploring a temporary union of varying levels of commitment that allowed them to have sex, access, birth control, and have an easy divorce if desired, as long as no children were involved. That's where stuff gets complicated, right? Um, you know, for the most part, you can just untie the knot, give her half your stuff, like if you've been married long, long enough, a prenup's not really going to work. I mean, uh, but generally speaking, if you don't have kids, she should stay stay employed and not quit her job. Um, this is like a frame thing that we can talk about another time, but you get the point. Uh, children void. The idea captured the minds of many progressives, including the British philosopher Bertrand Russell and the Denver judge and social reformer Ben B. Lindsay, who embraced the new economic and cultural freedoms of the post-Victorian era. While Ellis gave this type of temporary marriage a name, others had been talking about similar unions years before, including the German poet Johann von Goethe, pronouncing that wrong, obviously, who entertained the idea of his elective affinities in 1809, and the American paleontologist Edie Cope, who wrote his book, The Marriage Problem, in 1888. He's, in 1888, they're writing books about marriage problems. That, they like could you imagine taking this dude from 1888 put him in a time machine and bring him over here today and let him see what marriages look like today just just marinate on that for a second and you know he's written a book in 1888 called the marriage problem i wonder what problems he was talking about at that time uh that marriages should start with a five-year contract sure five-year lease same thing right uh, that either spouse could end or renew with a further 10 to 15 year contract and if all still went after that a permanent contract in 19, 1888, they're, they're dealing with basically car leases in, in marriages back then. That's interesting. Uh, in 1966, the American anthropologist Margaret Mead suggested a two-step version of marriage, an individual commitment that would fit college students of limited means and could easily be dissolved or else converted into a parental commitment if they were ready and willing to take on the obligations of children. In 1971, the Maryland legislator Lena King Lee proposed a marriage contractual renewable bill so couples could annul or renew their marriage every three years that's an interesting concept in 20 or sorry 2007 a german legislator proposed a seven-year contract in 2010 a woman's group in the philippines proposed a 10-year marital contract that's interesting because philippines is a very conventional religious country um they don't generally believe in divorce if i'm not mistaken of the filipinos that i know and in 2011, Mexico City legislators suggested a reform to the civil code that would allow couples to decide on the length of their marital commitment with a minimum of two years. Well, it gives you a chance to, uh, you know, take it for a trial run, I guess, if, if that's what you're looking at. Anyway, clearly lifelong marriages was due for an overhaul, despite, I don't think marriages were lifelong, from, only until recent history. There's a book by Stephanie Kuntz, A History of Marriage. I've mentioned it before, and I reference it in my book as well. 
And uh, marriage has never been about love or any of those things. It's always been about the acquisition of in-laws. And there was divorces for hundreds of years or you know whatever you would have called them, hundreds or thousands of years, whether it's the idea of a, a divorce as it's known today, but unions would break up often. Um, and they would have to deal with the assets, the kids and, and you know stuff like that. And more often than not, uh, the father actually uh, maintained custody of the children, especially when they were a little bit older. Um, 100% of the time and a lot of these moms had to go back to their you know their family or they ended up working in a brothel or something like that despite all the talk however no laws were ever passed and the idea of renewable marriages remained just that an idea but temporary marriage see I don't think that this would ever become anything and I'll tell you why because we live in a female first primary social order and everything in law in society is 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 built around the notion that we have to protect you know women like men are disposable men are the disposable sex women are the protected sex so the reason why we've got to where we are today where we have uh, family legislation in almost all western countries uh, that is not particularly friendly to, to uh, men or fathers especially fathers more so than just men um, is to protect the female first primary social order even though you know it shouldn't need any said protecting because you know women so strong and independent today right Anyway, um, but temporary marriages have been actually actually been successful practice for centuries among Peruvian. Oh, here we go. Peruvian Indians in the Andes, in 15th century Indonesia and ancient Japan, where the Islamic world and the Islamic world and elsewhere. And it appears that we might be ready to put them in practice again. All right, let's see what they want to say here. Uh, in a recent survey, many millennials indicated they would be open to a beta marriage in which couples. I don't think that means like alpha or beta. It's like a trial in which couples would commit to each other for a certain number of years. Two years seemed to be the right amount, after which they would renew, renegotiate or split, as Jessica Bennett wrote in Time Magazine last year. While it wasn't a scientific survey, it points to a willingness to see marriages as something other than until death, which in fact, it is not. In 2013, 40% of newlyweds had been married at least once before. <laughs> I can't believe people do this like two, three times around. It's, it's comical. Because when you look at the stats, first time marriage is 50% failure rate. Of the ones that stay together, uh, only 13% in total indicate that they're still in love. And 3%, I believe it is, indicate that they're still in a state of bliss. So the vast majority of those that stay married are unhappily married. Probably because they don't have better options or they're too gross or they don't have the money to split up or I don't know, they're too plugged in or whatever it happens to be. And then after that, if they go and get remarried, every time you get remarried after that, the percentage, the, the, the chances of a divorce increase dramatically. I think first time it's 50, second time is 70, third time is definitely more than 70. I think it's 80 something percent. But anyway, people are going back and forth. So 40% of newlyweds had never been married, or sorry, had been married at least once before, according to the U.S. think tank, the Pew Research Center. Since 10% of first marriages don't even make it past five years, 10% of first don't even make it past, well, I was in that 10%. Uh, a renewal marriage contract makes more sense than ever. Our current contract until death might have worked when people didn't live all that long. According to American sociologist and author Stephanie Kuntz, there she is. Great book, by the way. Uh, marriage of History is what the title of the book is. Uh, the average marriage in colonial times lasted under 12 years. Um, what was colonial times? Let me just uh, do a quick Google search on what era that was. Yeah, colonial times, colonial times. So, prior to 1972, that's not that. Hang on. Early 17th century. During the 17th and 18th century. Okay, so that's what that was. Uh, temporary. Let's go back here to stream. Uh, till death, colonial times, under 12 years. So 12 years was a typical marriage length, but 300 years ago. Uh, or when many women died in childbirth, freeing men to marry multiple times, which they did, of course. Uh, and when men of means needed women to cook, clean, and caretake, and women needed men for financial security. Yeah, so this is an interesting point because... This was a time, you know, when men of means, so if you had financial resources, you would often have, um, you know, your woman stay home, cook, clean, and caretake, You'd basically be a homemaker, which, you know, like, interestingly is, um, like, the toxic feminists hate that. Like, why do anything for the express pressure of men 
when you don't need no man and you should just go out and get a career and a degree and don't have kids and sort of stuff like that. And that's why we've got a bit of a messy world today because of that notion. And in some cases, men of means even had multiple women uh, cook, clean, and caretake for the children in the household, while men pr provided financial security. Um, the interesting thing is, is women don't need no man today, but everything in family law is written in such a way that it ensures her financial security today still. So she has freedom, but still has the benefits of financial security from the dude. But that isn't why we marry nowadays. Still, we congratulate couples on their anniversaries and get nostalgic as the years add up, 15, 25, 50, 75 years, and as the years of wedding bliss, not always. Many long-term marriages are loveless and sexless. As I pointed out earlier, again, what was it? 13% uh, are in a state of where they still love each other, and uh, only 3% are in a state of bliss. And like the whole notion of a, of a wedding, of a marriage, is basically sold to people, I think, younger people for sure, especially if they spend a lot of time watching Disney and all the crap that, um, you know, the plugged in media wanted you to believe in, um, was that you would be in a state of bliss. Just go get married. She'll love you forever. She'll enthusiastically want to jump your bones every day sort of thing. Uh, but the reality of that is it's not true. The most popular Google search for men today is uh, how do I get my wife here? Actually, let's go through that exercise because I shared this earlier uh, a week or so ago. Uh, how do I get my wife? Oh, here, let me put it up on the screen for you and the stream. Let's go a little bit bigger for you. How do I get my wife? Okay, so these are the recommended um, solutions to this search. How do I get my wife to fall in love with me again? How do I get my wife to love me again? How do I get my wife to lose weight? How do I get my wife to be more adventurously sexually? How do I get my wife to trust me? How do I get my wife back? <laughs> Forgive me, respect me on the house deed. The main ones seem to, here, let's put two after wife, two. To fall in love with me again, to lose weight, to be more adventurous sexually, to trust me, forgive me, respect me, stop snoring. <laughs> uh, yeah, they don't seem to be particularly aligned with um, the notion of what, you know, we're sold, you know, for marriage, right? Anyway, but that isn't why we marry nowadays. Uh, wedding bliss, not always. Many long-term marriages are loveless and sexist. Yeah, okay. Well, we can see by the Google searches uh, what <laughs> what dudes are looking for. I wonder what women search for. Let me just, uh, how do I get my husband? Here, let's reverse that. How do I get my, uh, oh, hang on. How do I get my husband to, and let's add the stream. Oh, hang on. So how do I get my husband, hang on, not to love me again, let's just put two. How do I get my husband to love me again, talk about his feelings? Don't, don't fo follow any of that, talk about his feelings, love language bullshit, guys. How do I get my husband to move out? How do I get my husband to help around the house, to pay attention to me? As we know, you know, for women, attention is the coin of the realm for them. That's what they're interested in. How do I get my husband to leave? How do I get that, my husband to leave my house? I don't know, but for the most part, whenever I talk to couples, it always seems like the dude is paying that paying for the house. So here we have, how do I get my husband to leave my house? Anyway, how do I get my husband to exercise, fall in love with me again? There's not a lot of, you know, um, indications there that there's warm fuzziness uh, and it. it's, it's, it's tied in the same problems guy had, you know, dudes have. Um, and sometimes full of anger and resentment, but if they make it until a spouse dies, success. Anyway, this is almost over. Uh, longevity alone shouldn't be the marker of a happy, healthy marriage. Rather than staying in marriages until death, renewable marriages should allow partners to tweak their marriage contract accordingly. Or agree. could you imagine like after three years, you're like, ah, you know what? I think we want to you know, tweak this arrangement because um, I'm not getting hummers anymore and she's put on a little bit too much weight. You know, and then she comes at you with, uh, oh, he needs to pay for this or he needs to do more of this around the house or something like that you know, then you're getting down to the point of negotiating desire, which only leads to resentment down the road, turns into a tra train wreck. Um, tweak their marital contracts or agree that it's beyond tweaking and end it without a shock or drama of a contentious divorce or lingering doubts about what went wrong. And as the late Nobel Prize winning economist Gary S. Becker noted, if every couple had to personalize their marital contract based on what they consider important, there would be no more societal stigma of judgment over what is essentially private decisions. 
If society is truly concerned about the client in marriage, perhaps it's time to rethink until death. And I don't, it's not to rethink. See, I'll tell you what the solution is here, guys. It's not to rethink until death or, you know, putting in terms. That would just give a guy an out in case things go sideways, in case, you know, she blimps up and, you know, packs on maximum density. Um, in case she turns into a psychopath and you can't untie the knot unless you go through all the, you know, you got to jump through all the hoops to make that sort of thing happen. It, like it would have some benefit to men, you know, generally speaking. But honestly, if you want to see a increase or an incline in marriages, have women, you know, return to more feminine roles, men, you know, return to more masculine roles, stop trying to feminize men, stop trying to masculinize women. Uh, men lead, men have authority in the household. That's another big part too is to, like for hundreds of, well, since the dawn of time, basically, when men and women were getting together and, you know, having kids and, and forming families and doing all this stuff was, was men were always at the head of the household. They always had the authority. They had responsibility to the family to protect, provide, feed, you know, fight off the saber tooth tigers and, tigers and all that stuff. But along with those responsibilities came the authority to make decisions and to make calls. Today, men don't have authority anymore. So you want to see an improvement in marriage rates and, uh, you know, like anything that ties into that. Stop the pussification of the West is what it boils down to. But nobody wants to hear that. It's like, oh, that's misogyny. That's, you know, you're just, you just want to go back in a time machine. I don't care. You know, you could do whatever you want. It doesn't, it really doesn't affect me because I've structured my life in such a way that I avoid these nightmares. And, you know, you can too. I mean, I talk a lot about that in my book, obviously, and a lot of these other podcast episodes, but you get the point. Anyway, uh, blah, 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 and grooms to be truly want to be happy, then it's time for them to take responsibility for defining their goals and expectations in a renewable contract and stating out loud on paper, I choose you again as often as they mean it. How about, how about all the ladies get together and take off their pink pussy hats and go down to par uh, Parliament Hill and uh, start marching on bureaucrats and policymakers and letting them know that, uh, the guys that they love, that they want to be with, that they want to have their babies are not marrying them because of hostile family laws. And to at least, you know, at least start with making family law more balanced. Uh, it looks like Vicki Larson is the author of this one. Hey guys, I really hope that you enjoyed that short clip. If you did, consider supporting the creation of content by checking out my supplement line. Pinned in the top comment below of this video in the comments, there's a link to the unpluggedalpha.com forward slash shop. Uh, when you click through, you'll be able to land over here and the entire lineup is broken down by category that it performs best in, estrogen metabolism, fat burning, your foundational essentials for health, immune health, performance, and testosterone support. If you check out with coupon code alpha10, you'll get 10% off on your first order. There's also the option to use the subscribe and save model where regular shipments will be sent over to you on a regular basis. And that gives you a little bit of a discount and your supplement facts are always broken down over here. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have an awesome day. And again, check out that link. It's pinned in the top comment below in this video. Peace out.